This lecture is about alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Alpha, beta, and gamma are three different particles that a radioactive nucleus can emit in order to become more stable. And alpha, beta, and gamma decay are each names for the process of emitting that specific particle. A lot of physics doesn't require much memorization, but this is one of the few areas that does. You're going to need to memorize all of the information that I've listed here about each type of particle. So we'll start with alpha particles and decay. Alpha particles have two neutrons and two protons and no electrons. This means they're helium nuclei with a plus two charge. The symbol for an alpha particle is the Greek letter alpha and the charge is positive two. Alpha particles have the highest ionizing power, which means they have the most ability to strip electrons off of other atoms. That means they're the most dangerous to humans because remember the more ionizing power, the more capable the radiation is of damaging our DNA. They have low penetrating power, however, they can be stopped by something as thin as a tissue. So alpha decay is a name for what happens when an unstable nucleus emits an alpha particle. Its atomic number decreases by two, its nucleon number decreases by four, and its charge decreases by two. So I've written the nuclear equation for what happens during alpha decay. You can see, just like I said, the proton number decreases by two, the nucleon number decreases by four, and the charge decreases by two, and you're also left with this additional alpha particle. As a reminder, nuclear decay always makes a nucleus more stable, so if an atom has too many protons, alpha decay occurs and reduces both the proton and neutron number by two. So alpha decay really only happens with larger nuclei. I talked about this line of stability graph in my separate lecture on radioactive decay, which I've linked in the description. So assuming you already know what this means, alpha decay is most likely to occur anywhere between the purple line and the curve of the red line. Because what happens with alpha decay is it decreases the neutron number by two and the proton number by two. So you can see that if you're in that general area between the purple and the red, and you decrease by that amount, you basically follow the purple line and get closer to the line of stability. Radiation always makes nuclei more stable. So that's specifically where alpha decay occurs, when there are too many protons compared to neutrons, and so the particle loses an equal number of both. A place where alpha decay wouldn't occur is when there are too many neutrons compared to protons. Because if the same thing happened and the neutrons decreased by two and the protons decreased by two, you can see that alpha decay would actually bring the element farther away from the line of stability, which doesn't really happen in radioactive decay. Radioactive decay always brings the atom closer to the line of stability instead of farther away. So alpha decay basically won't happen anywhere above that red line. We can do a few example problems with alpha decay. For all radiation problems, you will absolutely never be expected to have the periodic table memorized. You're not going to be given the table on the IB test. And so all these problems can be solved without a periodic table. You just need to remember that the number of protons and neutrons is conserved on each side of the equation. So as an example, one thing that you will have to have memorized is that the alpha particle has four nucleons in total. And I know that the total nucleon number has to be the same on each side of my nuclear equation. So I know that 226 is equal to x plus 4. So I can see that the nucleon number for that other element is 222. That's about as complex as alpha decay problems get in IB physics. You just need to remember that an alpha particle has four nucleons and two protons, and that each side of a nuclear equation has to be balanced. Example problem two says when an alpha particle collides with a nucleus of nitrogen 14, a nucleus X can be produced together with a proton. What is the atomic number and nuclear mass of X? So again, I just need to remember that the equations are always balanced on each side. The nucleon number has to be equal on each side. So I can see that X is going to have 17 nucleons and the proton numbers also have to be balanced. So I can see here that X would have eight protons. So as long as you know what an alpha particle is, it's pretty easy to solve problems with it. A beta particle is an electron or a positron, which is an antimatter particle that has the same mass as an electron, but positively charged. Technically, the mass is negative because it's antimatter. We'll talk about that more in a little while. The symbol is the Greek letter beta, which looks a lot like a B with a long tail, and then a minus or a plus sign next to it to symbolize the charge, whether it's an electron or a positron. Beta particles have medium ionizing power, so they're not quite as dangerous as alpha particles to humans, but they also have more penetrating power. They can be stopped by something like aluminum. Beta decay is a little strange. One of two things happen. A neutron emits an electron and antineutrino and becomes a proton, or a proton emits a positron and neutrino and becomes a neutron. You're going to have to remember that neutrinos are associated with beta decay. They're their own separate particles. You can see that I've listed their symbols on the bottom left. And I also have the equations for beta minus and beta plus decay on the top of the screen. 
So beta decay occurs if an atom has too many protons or neutrons. It causes the number of protons and neutrons to become more balanced. Beta minus decay happens when there are too many neutrons. It changes a neutron into a proton. And beta plus decay happens when there are too many protons. It changes a proton into a neutron. So beta minus decay can happen anywhere above and to the left of the red line, and beta plus decay can happen anywhere below and to the right of the red line. Just to visualize this a bit more, if we imagine we have an element up here, beta minus decay causes it to lose a neutron and gain a proton. So you can see it would move this way along the graph, which brings it closer to the line of stability. And that's what nuclear radiation does. It makes the nucleus more stable than it was before. So that's why beta minus decay occurs above and to the left of the red line. And beta plus decay adds a neutron and takes away a proton. So it would move the nucleus up like this, which again you can see is moving toward the red line. So that's why beta plus decay happens below and to the right of the red line. There are two correct ways to write beta particles in equations, either as lowercase e or as beta, because they're both electrons and positrons. There's one really weird aspect of this notation that only comes up in beta radiation problems. We write the electron or beta particles as having proton numbers of minus one and plus one when doing beta decay problems. Obviously, they don't actually have these values. They don't have protons moving along with them. The numbers are there to balance the nuclear equations for beta decay. So this is just a way of saying that if an electron were emitted, you should expect a proton to appear somewhere else that didn't appear before, while the nucleon number remains the same, which is what beta decay does. I'll show you how this is used in a few equations. A nucleide of the isotope potassium-40, which you can see has 19 protons, decays into a stable nucleide of the isotope argon-40, which has 18 protons. Identify the particles x and y in the nuclear equation below. So I'm going to start by figuring out what the values are for x. I know automatically that this is beta decay and not alpha decay because the atomic mass is not changing. So beta decay keeps the nucleon number the same. So that's a way that you can distinguish between alpha and beta decay. Alpha decay reduces the nucleon number by four. Beta decay keeps it exactly the same. For x, I know that the proton numbers have to balance. So I can see that x's proton number is positive one. And I can see from my equation on the top that this goes with a beta positive particle or a positron. So I know that X specifically is a positron, so I would record it like this in my answer. And I know that if a positron is emitted, according to my equations, a neutrino is also emitted. So that means that Y has to be a neutrino and not an antineutrino. Beta decay is complicated in that way. You have to have it memorized that when you have a positron, you'll also have a neutrino. And when you have an electron, you'll have an antineutrino. These equations are not given in your IB data booklet. As long as you can memorize those above equations, the nuclear balancing equations are pretty easy to solve. These are a few other notes on beta decay. I'm going to have you copy them down, but I'm not going to read them out loud. I just want to point out the bottom one that says if there isn't a positive or negative charge given for beta, assume it's beta negative, which means it's an electron. So sometimes problems will just say a beta particle instead of a beta minus particle. And when they do that, assume that they mean a beta minus particle, which is an electron. Gamma radiation and decay is the easiest one of the three to understand. A gamma ray is a photon with a very short wavelength and high frequency. It's actually the highest energy part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The symbol is a Greek letter gamma, which looks kind of like a Y, and it has no charge because it's just a photon. It has the lowest ionizing power of the three types of radiation, but it has the most penetrating power. It can be stopped by lead, but it takes much more to stop it than the other two particles we talked about. So gamma decay happens after alpha or beta decay. An electron is excited and releases a large amount of energy as it drops energy levels. So remember I talked about in a previous video, which I've linked in the description, that as electrons drop energy levels, they emit photons. After a nucleus has experienced radiation, its electrons drop in energy levels and release gamma photons. You can see according to the gamma equation on the top that the nucleus itself is not changed at all by gamma decay, it just emits a gamma particle with no proton or neutron number. As an example problem, a uranium atom emits a gamma particle. Write the nuclear equation to represent this. This is the easiest of the three because the uranium atom is just not affected by losing that photon. Some of its electrons are in a lower energy state, but that's just not really accounted for in nuclear equations. These are some general things you'll have to remember. If you're trying to figure out which type of radiation occurred, if the atomic mass changed, alpha decay occurred, and if the proton number changed by an odd number, beta decay occurred. Just one last thing that you may have noticed, but I wanna make clear, you can see that the alpha particle has much more mass than the beta particle, and the beta particle has more mass than the gamma particle. One last observation about these particles I want to make is how they move in magnetic fields. 
This is a throwback to the corner right hand rule, which we used earlier in this course. If you don't know what that is, I've left a link to my lecture on that in the description. So these particles also have charges, so we can actually use the right hand rule to understand how they'll move in a magnetic field. If I use the right hand rule on this alpha particle because I know it's positively charged and the field is pointing out of the page, I find that the force is pointing to the right. On the beta minus particle, I find it's pointing to the left. On the beta plus particle, it's pointing to the right. And because the gamma particle has no charge, there's no force on it either. One other thing you'll notice is that because the alpha particle has twice the charge of either beta particle, it has twice the force as well. So if these particles were to move in a magnetic field, this is what each of their motions would look like. The alpha particle noticeably has much more mass than other types of radiation, so it moves in a much larger circle than the others in a magnetic field. A beta minus particle, in comparison, will move in a tighter circle. This is actually an exaggeration. It would actually be a much, much smaller circle than the alpha particle because the mass is so different. The beta plus particle would move in the same way as the beta minus particle, but in the opposite direction. And the gamma particle wouldn't be affected by the magnetic field at all because it doesn't have a charge, so it would just move straight. So there are times when you'll be asked how each of these charges would move in a magnetic field. So to understand that, you'll have to know their charge, the right-hand rule, and how their different masses compare to each other. So that's everything you need to know about alpha, beta, and gamma radiation.